how can a client or prospect evaluate your expertise? See how you're different than other people and tell how you're better. That's one of the key questions that I've seen advisors struggle with because everyone claims that they're really good at what they do, which is what you would expect them to do. But when it comes to having proof, then that's something that's difficult to provide. And clients do have substitutes for using our services. Uh, what they could sometimes do is they could do things on their own, they could hire someone else, or they could decide to do nothing. And if those options happen, then we are losing out in that process. Now, this is a very diverse group. And one of the issues that will arise is compliance. Depending on where you work, you may or may not be able to use the kinds of tools that we're discussing today. And that's something that you would need to be aware of in your own institutions. For example, if you're in an IROC firm, then they seem to have more restrictions. If you're in a bank-owned firm, they seem to have more restrictions, etc. So the question is, uh, if you're in a place like that, then, well, okay, what are you doing here? But one of the reasons you might be here uh, is that you can see how these tools can be used, and you may find that they can be useful for some of your clients. So you can share with them, well, okay, I don't actually do these things myself, but this is something that you may want to consider. And if you're deciding that you would like to have your own path to personal independence, then we're talking about mechanisms for creating personal branding. So this can be an exit strategy. And if you want to try things, then what some people do is they create pseudonyms. Right? So then you can monitor your competitors without them necessarily knowing that you're looking at them. Now, if you're deciding to go that route, then uh, Twitter is a very good tool because that's very easy to be anonymous with. Uh, some other people go the blogging route, uh, which is a little more questionable because you figure if you're going to take the time to create original content, you'd want to be recognized for that. But in Canada in particular, you don't see this in the US or in Europe, but in Canada there's something weird about us we like the anonymity aspect. And you'll see people who write amazing content, but they're too afraid to let anyone know who they are. So they're not able to get any marketing benefits from all the work that they're doing. So compliance is something that you want to be cognizant of. Now, if you are allowed to use these tools, then what you'll find is that now you have an edge over your competitors who have constraints. Because what you'll find is it's the largest organizations with the most money who can afford advertising all over the place who tend to not use these tools. And so that means that for the smaller individuals, they have a huge opportunity. And with social media, it's really about building connections with real people. Now, unless you're Apple, it's very hard to have a strong affinity to a brand. We tend to have affinity to people themselves. And with these tools, what you can do is something that large institutions have a great deal of difficulty doing. You can exude your personality so that people are connecting with you, and if you decide that where you are is not where you want to stay, you want to go somewhere else, you have a greater likelihood that the connections you've made will move with you rather than stay with the institution that you happen to be with. And also, it's all free. So we're not talking about things that will consume lots and lots of money. Because uh, I used to uh, spend time helping insurance advisors uh, make more money. And I had to keep looking for things that wouldn't cost them anything because that would always be a, an issue. But this cost is not even a factor. It's more the willingness. And the skills that you develop when you're using these tools are portable. So that means that they belong to you. And that is very good because you're adding to your own abilities. And they're also transferable. So the things that we're talking about here are things that I've learned on my own, uh, which shows that even actuaries can learn. Anyone can. And because I, there's nothing I sell related to marketing or social media, that makes me more credible in many cases than someone who sells services in that field. Because there's no vested interest. If you go to sessions on social media, and I have for a number of years, the typical message is that you absolutely must be using these tools. There's absolutely no way that you can do it on your own. You absolutely must hire us. Like, that's the general message. And what we'll see is that that's not really the case. There are things that you can do 
that don't require huge commitments and you don't have to be on Facebook with stores and all these things that a Coca-Cola or a Starbucks might have. You don't even need to be on Facebook because you may find that LinkedIn is a much better environment for you. So even if you're not able to use these tools, these are, these are things that you might be able to make your clients aware of. And then what you're doing is you're adding value to them in an area where they cannot pay you. And so that's a way to invoke reciprocity because what you're doing is simply helping them. So we'll look at a se of several different areas. One of them is your expertise. Because we each claim, especially in a group like this, to have lots of expertise and be really good choices. The problem with expertise is that clients can gauge it. A client cannot tell whether you optimize their tax return. They can't tell whether you wrote a will in just the right way without any of the flaws that may occur. They can't tell whether you selected suitable investments for them. They don't know whether the insurance you put in place is really the right type or not. They really have no way to tell those things. Because what you're providing is a service, and a service is intangible. And so what people do is they look for things that they can see. And from them, they infer or impute what may be your area of expertise. And it's because clients are not able to really gauge the value of what we provide that they want to pay by the hour. They want to pay fixed fees. Because really, if you are solving a client's problem and you can do it in 10 minutes and someone else will take two days, you can't really, then by rights, you should be able to send a bill for two days of work. But your client will say, well, you only worked on this for 10 minutes, I'll pay you for those 10 minutes. Because they can't tell that your level of knowledge may be so much superior to other people that you're actually saving them money. And so we have these things that are just side effects of us having difficulty demonstrating our expertise to people. But what you can do is you can apply your expertise. So we can do things that are super, superficial and things that are related to appearances. So for instance, we talk about our designations our years of experience. Uh, people look at how we dress and what we're driving, how we talk, those kinds of things. Because from that, people are able to infer other things about us. And they look at our actions so they can see whether, okay, when I call this person or send them an email, they respond to me quickly, that's good. They follow up, they keep their promises. It doesn't mean that we're very good at our work because by definition, most of us are average, right? We have to be. And we often have many competitors. So it's people cannot really tell if this is the person who in the distribution is in the top quartile or top 10% or whether someone in the median. Uh, and also what you find is that using these tools, you're creating visibility. So it's like advertising, right? Except here, it's free. You're not paying for it. The people who consume the advertising are paying for it with their attention. And if you can get people to pay you with attention, it's, easy, well, it's easier to get them to pay you with money afterwards. And that's something that can be quite valu valuable for you to use. Trust. In trust, there are a couple of elements. One is expertise. This is coming from a book called Let's Get Real by Mahan Khalsa. He says that trust has two elements. One is expertise, and the other is intent. Now, when you look at expertise, that's something that you can show fairly easily. In essence, your resume shows that, that these are the things I've done. Testimonials are good signs that there are clients who think that what you've done is good work. And then the people you associate with are also signs of the caliber of person that you are. And a really good place to show expertise, perhaps the best place to show expertise, is LinkedIn. Because there, your entire network is generally visible. So people can see who you're associated with, or to put it differently, who is willing to associate with you. They can see, because I mean, I see all these people, they talk about how great they are, and I say, well, okay, where are your testimonials? 
well, they don't really have testimonials, or if they have them, they had to write it, and the client would just agree it was that it was, they had done it, right? Those kinds of things. With LinkedIn, it's harder to play that game. I mean, you, there could still be things behind the scenes on how the testimonials are written, but if I write a testimonial for Larry, and Larry writes a testimonial for me, and it's all done on the same day, hmm, might look a little suspicious, right? And so those kinds of things become easier to spot in that kind of environment. And with expertise, that isn't really enough to set, our, to, set our, sorry, to set us apart. Because even in this room, we will have people who provide similar services to what we provide. Now, we may feel that we are the better choice for various reasons, but from a client's point of view, they can't really gauge those differences. So it'll be like a Coke Pepsi sort of thing where from their point of view, they're not going to walk out because it's not the flavor that they like. They may even be happy with 7-Up because it's close enough. And if they can't value, then they don't necessarily want to pay a premium for what you're offering. So you get into the commodity type pricing because this person is the same as that person. Uh, why would I pay anything more for that? So expertise is essential. We have to be able to actually do the work that the clients are paying us for, but it's hardly sufficient. The other element is the key at setting us apart, and that is intent. And intent means showing on an ongoing basis that you have your client's best interests at heart. And you might be able to fake that over the short term, but it's very difficult to fake that over the long term. And with social media, what you're doing is something which is permission-based. You can't make anyone receive anything you're doing. They have to decide on their own that they want to receive it. And when they no longer want to receive it, then they stop. And there's a scorecard. So you can look at people, and if they say they're really good, et cetera, you can see how many connections they have, how many tweets they've done, how many testimonials. You can't fake those things anymore. Because there's this level, oh my, the cliche, sorry, try and avoid those. But there's this level playing field where you can just see where other people stack up. And that makes it intimidating for people who are maybe not so good, but it gives recognition to the ones who have actually put in the time to be good. And because social media is free, there's really no reason to stop people from using it. So when they don't, then it's an even bigger failing on their part. So for instance, uh, when I started blogging, which was five years ago, that was because in those days I was helping insurance and investment advisors make more money. And I figured that their big issue is trust because they're seen as salespeople, which is what they are. Not that that's bad, but that creates a stigma. And I figured that if advisors, and by extension, I, I talked to accountants and lawyers other groups, I saw the same thing would apply to them that if they started giving free samples of their work, then people would then have a way of gauging them, right? And I would tell it, people, hey, why don't you do this? And it was like, no, I can't do that because if anyone saw this one page I used, then I'd have no sales. Like there'd be just weird thoughts to those kinds of things. But that's an unusual way of looking at it because that shows more of a fear-based, the world is limited, the glass is half full. Because with social media, it's really based, about, it's based on generosity, where you're giving things out to people, and it's the giving process that attracts things back to you. And what you'll find, that because social media is so easy to use, and because it's free, there are really no barriers stopping people from using it. And the real benefits don't come from saying that, oh, I do, I'm on Twitter, or I'm here, I'm there. The real benefits come when you stick with it. Because what will happen, as with many things, is that people will generally give up. So they're happy, they get started, and then they do a few tweets or this or that, and then they're expecting the return on investment. I did this thing, I wrote this article, I didn't get any business. Right? They're looking at it from that point of view, rather than looking at it as a form of philanthropy, a form of generosity, where what they're doing is trying to help people. And so those people tend to give up. And then what happens is people who stick with it just show their merits over time. So in my case, I started in 2007, uh, 2007, February, and so I've written 500 posts. Now, I'm not claiming that those are amazing posts, but 
Some of them are probably reasonable, but it shows something about a person to stick with that for that length of time. And if you look at the word count, that's probably about 250,000 words. So I'm not saying it's brilliant or anything, but here's the thing. Anyone else could have done the same thing. Anyone else could have started it even sooner, but they didn't. And with this kind of thing, there are fewer excuses because there's really nothing stopping them except their heart and not being willing to commit the time to share things with people. Right? So it's effective in those sorts of ways. Now, I realize that there's a whole range of expertise in this room, and I don't want to intimidate you by making it look like you have to be doing everything, otherwise you're losers, because that would certainly be incorrect. For people who are starting out, the easy way is to be a parrot. And what that means is simply sharing things that other people have created or found already. And so, if you're on LinkedIn, then you just post a link to that as a status update. So that's just a sentence or two. And it's an article that you have probably read already, because in our work we do need to keep up to date in our areas of expertise. Some of those things would be of interest to others. So just share something like that. So maybe in the course of a week you decide that you can commit to sharing one item or two items. So that would take you, say each item takes you 10 minutes. So you're looking at committing maybe 10 or 20 minutes in a week. Right? And so that may be a really good way to start. Nothing will happen after you've done your first few. It's not that people will call you up saying, hey, I'd really like to send you some money, what's your address? But what will happen is as the months go by, you'll be establishing that you're a consistent person. Right, so what we're doing is what Seth Godin calls using consistent, persistent generosity. And it's that continuing that will lead to the value. And through that process, you may decide that there are other things that you want to do. But if you could commit, say, 10 minutes a week or 20 minutes a week, you can certainly get started by sharing something uh, to the extent that compliance allows you to do that. So that's a really good way to get started. And what you could do if you don't really want to use LinkedIn is you could do that as a tweet on Twitter. And if you wanted to, you could actually connect the two, so when you do something in one place, it goes to the other environment also. You can decide whether Facebook is the place to use. I find that I don't use Facebook because I'm connecting with people in a business context. And since I'm an actuary, I have no friends anyway, so if I use Facebook, it would be very, very lonely. Very lonely. But you may find, depending on your business, that there's a certain place that your uh, centers of influence are, there's a certain place that your prospects are. And that's the environment that you want to be participating in. So the parrot approach is a really good way to get started because you'll see that nothing bad really happens. It's easy to do and it's not a lot of work. Say you decide that, well, today is Wednesday. Say you decide that Wednesday is the day that you'll post one update. So in a year you're doing 50, right? It's not that big a deal, or twice a week it's 100, not that big a deal. So you can probably start with something like that. So that's a really good way to get started, but it's not especially effective. But that's a way to at least get the process started. In what we're doing, we want to move beyond the pundit stage, sorry, beyond the parrot stage generally, to the pundit stage, where we are creating original content. Because that's where we show our expertise. The other way is just showing our generosity that we found this thing and we think it would be of value to you, and that's, that's good, but it doesn't show that we can do our work, which is ultimately something that people would like to be assured of. And this is where you can decide which medium is best for you. If you like writing, which is what I seem to prefer, then you can blog. If that's too much to do in the beginning, what you can do is you can leave comments on blogs that other people have written until your confidence level, level builds up. What you can do is if you want to be clever about it, say there's an article that you think your network would be interested in seeing. Go to the blog, leave a comment on it. When that comment goes live, because sometimes these things get moderated, sometimes they go live. When it goes live, then inform your network about it. So you have shown generosity by sharing something and also you have uh, got your own content there. Yes? What do you mean by going live? Okay, there are some people who, like, suppose you have a blog, so you've written something, and then at the bottom, people can write their comments, and some bloggers are paranoid that someone will write something bad, 
and they'll get sued, horrible things will happen. So in the beginning, it's not uncommon for bloggers to moderate comments. So they'll be notified when someone leaves a comment, they'll read the comment and they will approve that before it goes live. Then what happens is as you get at the, after you've been doing this for a while, you realize that virtually no one reads your stuff anyway. And if, even if you've got garbage there, at least someone is there. Uh, and then it's easier to delete the garbage rather than to annoy people and put in this other barrier. Because in essence, what you're saying is that you don't trust your readers to say something sensible. And the, the people who write nasty things are probably not going to take the time to read the kinds of things that we would be reading as professionals. Uh, but there are different stages. And another thing that you can do if, if you like the writing part is on LinkedIn there are many groups. There will be groups that will consist not of your peers, that's the, group, that's the category most people seem to join is, hey, I want to be among my peers, but you want to really be among people who could be potential prospects. And so you participate in those groups and you start getting known and you start uh, establishing your experience. So that's one option, is if you like writing, then you can write. Now, if you prefer talking, then that's fine too. What you can do is record your voice, and then you have a podcast. Now, if it turns out you're someone who likes showing things, whether it's through a PowerPoint or drawing things on a whiteboard, then you can set up your cheap little camera and record that, and then you can post these things on YouTube. So whichever medium, because I find that people have different preferences. And so in my case, I'm speaking from a mind map because I want to have a general idea of what I'm saying, but I'm not reading it word for word. But I need that, that crutch there. There will be other people who can just talk without, I was going to say without thinking, but that's not what I meant. Uh, but there are people who are just very good at that, and other people, uh, so you need to pick the medium that's right for you, but they're all available to you, and they're all free. And so you can start off as a parrot, and then you can go to the pundit stage. And what you'll find is that as you do these things, you get a free prize. And it's a very, very valuable free prize. What happens is you change as a person. Because when you are being generous, then it makes you more generous. And somehow, I don't know how, people can sense that. And so there's something... In as an actuary, I can't explain these, uh, these things that I can't see in formulas and things. But try it out and you'll see that there's, there's some type of attraction where people who are doing good things and helping people uh, end up with better results. So that can be a very interesting option. And then you start attracting people to you who like what you're doing. And these may, these may be people that you don't really know. Now, we'll go to the questions and answers, because that's really when the, the session comes alive, because that way we can see what your issues are. Uh, before coming here today, I went to the Estate Planning Council of Halton website, and I looked up the list of members, and I somewhat randomly selected 10 members and looked them up on LinkedIn to see how they were using social media, because for most of us, that's probably the place to be. And so of these 10 people, and I'm not claiming this is an absolutely scientific study, but, uh, and it's more towards the beginning of the alphabet because it's just easier to start there. But I saw that of these 10 people, there were only six who were on LinkedIn at all. So four were not, and I don't want to extrapolate, though I have that tendency. Oh, 40% were not. And of these six, there were only three who had public photos. So like, you can't even see who these people are and then of these 10 people, who are presumably all very good at their work, there were in total two recommendations. And in total, there were 586 connections. So when you look at something like that, you say, well, okay, if these people are that great, then why are they not on LinkedIn? If they are there, like, why are they hiding their faces? Because ultimately, at some point, unless you do everything by phone calls, you will see one another. Uh, so it just seemed a little odd. And then, of these same 10 people, I love all this analysis, but don't worry, I'm almost done. The, of these 10 people, only three had a description on your website. Right? Like, this is your website, you've joined this group for networking, other things, and these people hadn't taken the time to even write anything about themselves. So someone who finds your website and says, here's someone's name, 
they don't really know what that person does. So they, and it's not that there's a link to their LinkedIn profile, they try and find out who this person is, and they can't really. And then also, the last point, is on the website, I looked at, I did scroll through the whole list, because I'm not really good with names, and I'm not really good with faces, but with the two, I, I have a better chance. And so I wanted to see if there are any faces there that I might recognize, and I could only find one photo in the whole group. <laughs> And so I looked up that person on her business website, and she doesn't have a photo there. So I don't know if these are deliberate strategies that people are using, or whether these are oversights, but I'm trying to put on my hat as a potential client, and I'm looking for someone, and here's an organization that should have credible members that have gone through a selection process. And there's so little there that I can't make a good decision on who to even call. So that's what I wanted to cover in the, the beginning part. And now we can have questions and answers so we can deal with your specific issues. Who would like to go first? Yes. Did you say there were six out of ten who were on LinkedIn? There were six out of ten who were on LinkedIn. Of that sample that I picked. And half of those, of the six that were on LinkedIn, three had public photos. Now it may be, because in LinkedIn you can have different settings, and you can basically restrict information so that strangers can't see it. So it could be that if you were connected to the person, you might be able to see the photo, but I was just looking at it publicly. But my guess is people don't take the time to change those settings. They probably don't have photos. You've probably heard of this thing called Facebook, Face photo, right? LinkedIn, photos, except like not drinking beer, more professional. There's really no downside to having a photo. Right? It's just one of those little things, because it just raises questions about all these other people who do have photos, like why are these people not having theirs? And that is maybe the wrong message. Yes? I'd just like to say that those at the other end of the office are friendly. <laughs> okay. It's good that there are friendlier people. I don't know if that's statistically true or not. It's possible. <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate that. Yes? Uh, just about Twitter. I, I use Twitter, but uh, I guess one of my concerns with Twitter is that my followers can be, you can't choose your followers, obviously. But uh, you, from a geographic perspective, I mean, I've got followers from you know the GTA, but quite a few from, you know, California and all over the place. Uh, so I just, it just kind of leaves me a little cold that, you know, I'm trying to reach people, which is what you're trying to do with Twitter. Uh, I really have no control over attracting followers from a, a geographic area. Yes, what you're doing is you're attracting people who find that what you're doing is of value. And you will find people who aren't in the same geographic area. But depending on how you're doing it, you may find that you get people in the right area. So for example, on Twitter, because again, you can't make anyone follow you. They have to decide. But for whatever reason, I'm being followed by the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Money Sense, uh, some other publications, right? And so when people, so when you have a journalist following you because of things that you're writing, then it shows that you're writing things of some value. It's very useful to be able to craft headlines. If you think of Twitter as an experiment in generating bullet points or headlines, then you can see whether what you're doing is actually working. Because you've found an article that you think is of some interest, and then you create a summary which is meant to be enticing enough that people will then read that and click to the article. And then you can measure these things. So for that experiment, it doesn't really matter if they're in California or the, some other country. It's a measure of, is that message connecting? Now, if you're focusing on a geographic area, then LinkedIn could be a better tool in that sense. Because you can be connected the, to these people, and you can connect the LinkedIn and the Twitter together, so the same message is going to both places. Another option is to have a newsletter. And there you know exactly who is receiving it, and you can see who opened what and what they clicked on, and that can be very good for good analytics. So there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. It's just showing that there are people who 
are paying attention to you. And maybe by having better headlines or more content, whatever it is, there may be more local people. But I think for, because most of us are only dealing with a small number of clients. So we don't necessarily need or would ever have like millions of followers or hundreds of thousands. Like even getting hundreds of followers may be enough for our goals. Uh, but once you've got that content, so what I do, because after I started doing the blogging, I told advisors they should start newsletters, and so I started one just so that I could show them it was possible. And what I found with the newsletters, you get good ideas of how many people are opening it, etc. You can see what people like. So I found that if I had Warren Buffett in a headline, people would read it. If I had Steve Jobs in a headline, people would read it. Now, I can't put in those every issue, right? Because then it's just about those people. But what I could see is that people are clicking on these certain things. They like this. I thought they would be interested in this link on productivity because um, they're no more productive than I am. But they're clicking on this other stuff about, for instance, in my latest issue, the most clicked article is about Starbucks and how they're a complete flop in Italy. They're not even there. And Italy is where Starbucks, like where uh, the Starbucks person got the idea, but they can't make it there. So somehow that was an interesting article to people, and I thought had practical things that this will help you. This will like, knowing Starbucks in Italy, like that's not going to do anything to bring anyone more business. But I know that people like those sorts of things. So on Twitter, what you can do, and this is my approach, is I try to have one update per day, so one tweet. So in the course of a month, I probably have 30, maybe 50. I take the five that I think are the most useful, like for like most timeless, etc., and that's my newsletter. So I'm, re I'm reusing the same stuff I already did, and, and now I'm just writing a few lines about, oh, here's something about Starbucks in Italy. Did you know that they started, that's where the idea came from, but they don't actually have any stores there. And that way... I can now track who's receiving that because virtually everyone who gets my newsletter is someone that I have met personally. So those are the people I care about most. Yes? Well, once you start down this trail, call it a trail, you are now on a road that basically you have to be consistent, as you said, and continue to keep the information flowing. Um, in the course of a week or a month, do you find this become super time consuming or are you just limiting to once a week, uh, a tweet per day, and a summary in your newsletter? Is that what time yeah. are you looking at? It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. And so the thing that takes me the most time is blogging. But the way I look at that is that I don't like donating money because I always worry about how it'll get used and all this. But I figure, and it, when it comes to donating money, like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates could donate a little bit more than I can, but they don't have any more hours in the week than I do. So I figure that if I donate time, then that's something that is more valuable. And with that, I'm helping people indefinitely. So I take my time to write blog posts. And I have two blogs. One I started for advisors to teach them about the marketing things I was learning. So that's marketingactuary.com. Uh, I've still continued that on. And then I had another one because advisors were saying, we don't have any content that we can tell our clients to read about various things. Because if you go to the stuff from insurance companies, whatever, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not written for real people. It doesn't really have substance or personality or depth. It's just fluffy stuff. So I wrote another blog for basically dealing with risk-related issues. And I would include interesting things too because otherwise you won't have any readers. What is that blog? Uh, that's called Riscario Insider. So I'll give you a link at the end, and so it'll have links to the blogs, etc., so you can see what's there. So if you, so the blogging, because I, I, I never had any writing in, tra sorry, any training in writing, and if you read my stuff, you'll probably agree. So I don't know if I could do that better or faster, or whatever. So the writing, each blog post probably takes me around three hours. Right? So that's about six hours. So if you cut out that which is the creation of original content. The rest of the stuff is maybe about two hours a week. I have a timer that I set for 15 minutes, and it counts down, and it has this loud sound at the end, and I have those 15 minutes to see if I can find something worth sharing with my network. And that's a mechanism to control time. 
Uh, and if you're just looking at, say, one update or two updates a week, week it won't really be a lot of time to commit. Yes, other questions? Just, just a comment, I know from but I don't know who hears John Tesh on the radio, but he has these little words about did you know, and they come up with little things about life in general or health or so on. What a perfect uh, segue to do it for your financial welfare for your, you know, I mean, I'm not doing it, but you're convincing it. Yeah, well, okay, it'd be good if at least one person gets convinced. But yes, you need to figure out your niche. Like on, on LinkedIn, I'm connected to this one person, and he has a daily quote. And a lot of them are really good. Right? And so I, I don't even know what he does. I guess I should look him up and see what he actually does. But this is something that's adding value because he's taken the time to curate and find something that is worth reading. And you may find the same thing, or you may have a particular interest in, well, Golf, for instance. There'll be a segment of your market that likes golf. And maybe if you have things on golf, that would attract certain people. And maybe that's your niche. Or maybe you have, like in my case, I have these two different, I really shouldn't have two blogs. But I can't stop because I have these two different interests. Because I'm very passionate about marketing because I think it's essential for a lot of us to be more successful. And I'm self-taught and I, I just want to share the things I'm learning. And then, like I'm an actuary, the only thing I really know how to do is measure and manage risk. And so if I'm not sharing what I'm learning through the blogging, but it's very hard for people to see, well, this person is talking about marketing and they're talking about risk. But, so I have them on separate blogs, but you might have a similar strategy where you have one channel that's one set of tweets that's related to, say, sports, another one that's related to insurance, investments, etc. But it's easy to spend a lot of time on these things, but the first thing is you just start with one thing and then decide how you want to continue it. Yes, there's a question here. Just more of an observation. I, I, this, I, I caught this on Twitter. So. Okay. Uh, one, a major Wall Street firm, which wasn't Goldman Sachs, has banned all social media. Um, because they're, they're noticing the product they're doing most of the people are going Which I think is interesting. I think for those that are sending stuff out, it's very beneficial, but I think for all those that continue to check for 24 hours a day, what firms are looking for, you know, the product technical at least Yeah, and it's, you want to send the right message to your clients and prospects. So if they think that all I'm doing is commenting on blogs or tweeting all day long, that's going to send the wrong message. And in fact, I'm busy during the day anyway, so if I'm doing something, it's generally first thing in the morning or in the evenings when I have some time. Now, there are tools that can automatically schedule your updates for you. So in essence, you're just filling a buffer with things that you want to be shared, and these tools will figure out the optimal times based on some kind of algorithm to share these things for you. And so those may come out during the course of the day, but they're not really me doing it, it's this tool. But you do need to uh, make sure that people think that you're actually working too, not just playing with these tools. Yes, there's a question here. Um, just a comment, actually. This company in Wall Street, they should probably just do a self-timer like you do for yourself. Allow everyone in their office to tweet about their company, comment on blogs for the first 15 minutes of the day, and then gets all cut off after that. Or maybe at <laughs> lunchtime. There are different ways, but when I used to work in the insurance world, in the corporate environment, like, we were not able to even access LinkedIn. Right? We couldn't go, like, okay, here are some hockey tickets, give them to someone. I want to see who's playing, right? You can't go to those websites because they're blocked. Like, there are tools that countries like, with repressive regimes use, that, is, that major companies in North America also use. And if you try and find out who's playing sports, well, that's considered sports and gambling, and you have to find some roundabout way. So there, one of the issues is trusting people, right? So uh, it would be nice if companies did, but if you look at compliance, that is in essence an organization saying that we don't trust our employees to use good judgment, and if they were to say something incorrect, we would not back them up. So we will control what they're able to do. Because there was a person at one of the, an investment person at one of the banks downtown, he was located young and bluer, 
And he was doing an excellent job on Twitter. He had these market-related updates, but there were links to things from publications. So he wasn't saying, buy this or do this or do that. It was just good information that GM is doing this, that sort of thing. And I don't know what happened, but that account disappeared because there was probably an issue with that kind of thing being done. One, yes. one of the Twitter issues I've heard is that people start to uh, tweet about their company, as you were saying, Jim, is that, uh, and they leave the company, whose followers are those? And, uh, so it, it, gets, it can get kind of muddy with regards to how you, how you manage your, who your LinkedIn people in, who your Facebook people in, who your Twitter followers are, who, whose property is <clears throat> Yeah, so you do need to be cognizant of those kinds of things and see what you're able to do within the context of the environment you're in because you don't want to get wrapped by compliance people. Yeah. Yes? Who are your clients? Like what business, what's your business? Oh, what model? do I actually do yes. when I'm not talking about social media? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and is there a motivation for your blog that other than the news have a lot of great ideas? Well, okay, I, I'm an actuary and the only thing I've ever done is insurance. Because when I was a kid, my parents said, we're here to make the world better. And so I thought that insurance was my calling because I didn't know anything better in those days. I thought that someone dies and here's money so the family can keep going on. I didn't realize it's just a business like any other business. But that's the reason I went into it. It was my plan A. So after I became an actuary, I spent about 10 years designing products. And I saw that products had pitfalls uh, because they don't necessarily work the way that advisors and the public think. Because if they did, then the profit levels wouldn't be as high as they are. Now, I didn't really, I was able to rationalize that because we were selling through independent advisors, and so we're just making the gun, right? So people can figure it and they do whatever they want with it. So I didn't really have an issue with that. Uh, but then I spent five years helping advisors sell. So that's the area, the era when I started doing the blogging, et cetera, to help them. And I guess I didn't really think of it in another way, I, but I saw that these, I was coming across people who didn't get into insurance because it was their calling. They got into it almost like a plan B or C, and they were doing it to make money. And my dilemma was that I would be in these meetings because in the bigger cases, typically I would be dealing with advisors doing a million of revenue or more. Because the smaller cases, because I had my own quotas and stuff, I, I, I couldn't add a lot of value to the small cases. But what I would see is that even with these more experienced advisors, 20 years of experience and CLUs, all of these great things, they were still seen as salespeople. And by being an actuary who had designed products, when we sat down with the accountant, I was lending my credibility to that, and then the accountants were generally okay. But the thing I had an issue with is that we weren't necessarily doing the best for the client in all those cases. And I couldn't really do anything about that apart from try to educate, because I don't believe in more regulation, et cetera, but I thought the only thing I could think of was to educate people, because buyer beware is okay as long as people have an option. And so that was another, that was a, a part of the motivation for blogging that I didn't discuss. But it was my way to help people have a better understanding. But what started happening is, because I was doing the blogging really to help advisors make more money, because that was my job, but the public started coming to me for advice. So they weren't going to these advisors that I was trying to encourage them to go to. And I saw, because I know nothing about selling, right? But I saw that there were people who were aching for help. They had real issues and they really didn't know where to go. And I saw that that was something I could help them with because I could certainly educate them and then they could have the opportunity to buy. And so three years ago, I started my company Taxevity and what I do is provide independent actuarial insurance reviews on a fee-only model. Because right now, if someone has an insurance policy and they're not sure they're protected well, they might go to their accountant because they're generally the most trusted financial advisors, but the way the products are, the complexity and the configuration, it's not really fair for the accountant to, like, they, they can't really answer those questions. And if you go to some place where the advice is free, there are the elements of bias. So I thought that if you have a fee-only model, then you're working in the same way as the true professionals like accountants and lawyers. And so that's the nature of my business. But I would not have that business if it weren't for social media because I've had people coming to me 
I don't really know about prospecting or those kinds of things. I mean, I've learned how to network, but I only started a few years ago. And LinkedIn, all these things. So I'm just sharing the things that I, I found to be effective based on my own experiences, but I can assure you, because like, if you look at trust, the latest Edelman Trust Barometer uh, for 2012 uh, puts financial services as the least trusted sector in the world, once again. Right, so we're dealing with some very major issues where people don't have a lot of trust, and so I'm just trying to do my part to help people in that area. So basically your business is to consult on a fee basis for the consumer, yes. and have you left coaching insurance people? Yeah, because you can't serve yeah. both groups. There's a conflict of interest. You have to either be on the side of the public or the side of the advisors. Other questions? I'm not sure that's true, but... <laughs> Can't you, I mean, you, you kind of paint all advisors with one kind of a brush there, I think. Um, <clears throat> so it just kind of clunked for me there. Um, well, I'm, I'm generalizing, but yeah. I've been in this business for a long time, and I saw that even at the high end of the market, there were issues that were of a concern to enough people that they wanted second opinion. Certainly not everyone is like that. And that's where using social media can be very helpful to help you stand apart from the ones that are maybe a little more questionable, right? Because it's a way to show your generosity, knowledge, etc. So when people make a decision, they can see, well, here's someone that I feel I can trust, and here are some signs that demonstrate that they are doing good things, they're, that they're essentially an advocate for me rather than an advocate for themselves. Yes? I know we're using social media in a gratuitous manner, business that we might get from that, but have you ever thought or have you ever read anything about issues that may um, deal with the content, of the digital content um, upon a woman's death, for instance? Is it not being pertaining to business building, but if, they, if somebody actually um, puts a lot of their own photographs or pictures or art or whatever onto uh, some type of social media, and then... Yeah, that would be more of a question for a lawyer. I, I'm not really sure what the rules are around that. Um, to the extent, virtually everything I do is licensed under Creative Commons, so it can be used for non-commercial purposes by whoever. I generally use Google products wherever possible so that they'll be there as long as Google is around, which is probably a few years. Uh, but I think there are various things that, uh, like say Facebook, if someone dies, then I think there are processes to close the account or make it a memorial or other things, but I, I don't know for a fact. A lawyer might know better. Yes? I'm a lawyer, but I don't necessarily know the answer, but I can give you a clue to it. There's an issue that I'm pretty sure you can give it out of the podcast. CBC Radio yesterday at noon had a special on that, had a specialist talking about that. In fact, uh, I think it is Google or Facebook or both. They will put on, they'll put on a disc, uh, so if someone's passed away, they will put their digital information on a disk and mail it by regular mail <laughs> to the personal representative. But I'm quite sure it's uh, CDC Radio News, if anyone wants to podcast. Very interesting. I just want to try to hear it. Um, a whole, that whole field of, of uh, you know, people with their estates, your digital estate. Oh, interesting. Thank you. I'm not sure how long I'm supposed to keep talking, but because no one's giving me signals saying, "Hey, stop!" <laughs> but is this? You're lucky people have to lock down the or throw things <laughs> out. <laughs> so maybe one final question, because I think I've probably used as much time as I'm supposed to use. Okay. The only people who locked out the those who had commitments. Yeah. So just to wrap up, uh, what you're doing online is in essence creating a digital tapestry. And you're creating it by the actions that you have that are visible online. So there will be certain things that you'll do that maybe in hindsight you wouldn't have done. So if you've only ever done 10 things online and one of them isn't the brightest, then it looks like 10% of what you've done is horrible. But if you keep doing things, then the things that are outliers will essentially, I mean, don't do anything like absolutely crazy, but the things that are outliers will tend to just get masked because you'll be adding more content, more detail, etc. And that's, because that seems to be one of the concerns is that these things are there forever. 
But that's not necessarily bad. If you have enough good things, then the odd thing that's not so good won't really uh, stand out. And a really good place for you to start, I think for most of you, except our younger guests, though it's not necessarily bad for you also, would be on LinkedIn. Because that's probably where a lot of your prospects are. And what you're doing then is you're helping Google find you. Because I was typing in not the same 10 people, but I was taking the names of some members of this group just to see what Google would show. And you may want to show up better or in different ways, etc. Because people do use search engines, right? And that's certainly an opportunity. So what you're doing then is you're helping clients choose you and you're also giving clients the opportunity to refer you. If you have any further questions, what I'll do is uh, I guess I'll send an email to Jasmine, but I have created a web page that has a video with more details on how to actually use social media and links to other things that are more detailed. So the website is www.promotecharma, so P-R-O-M-O-D, charma.com, slash E-P-C-O-H. And you can get more resources there. And I'll send Jasmine a link to that if you're interested and that, that's available to you. And if I can help you further, then I'd be glad to do that. Thank you so much for not throwing things at me and not walking out. On behalf of the estate planners of uh, Halton, uh, Vermont, I'd, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm sure you'll gain a few friends. Okay. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.